Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Chairman, my thanks to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. I uh, work close to the North Pole in Tromsø, where skiing is good in April still, as you see, and it's also good in May and in June. Um, I have no further disclosure, actually, except that I'm wearing a Dutch Surgical Society tie, which I'm not allowed to wear, but it was forced upon me late last night by Kes de Jong to give me an air of respectability. I'll dis share some thoughts with you about ERAS development in upper GI and pancreatic surgery. And uh, first, I think we uh, have to realize that we're in quite another country. Uh, if you look at this sketch, this is a patient on the morning of the third post-operative day. She's been mobilized, but only to the toilet. She still has an active wound drain. She's nil by mouth. She has a nasogastric tube in place. She's on parenteral nutrition, and her IV fluids are being discontinued just this morning. Now, it doesn't look very ERAS style, does it? And the funny thing is that this sketch is stolen from uh, the best uh, presentation that was awarded best abstract in uh, the ERAS conference two years ago in Cannes. And the reason for this is, of course, that this is about esophageal resections. And this is the paper by Chao Li from Feldman's group in Montreal. So this is another case entirely. So what is special about the upper GI and pancreatic surgery? Well, the, these patients are haunted by a particularly slow recovery. Uh, the rates of major morbidity is still high, and they have a profound loss of GI function, especially uh, for the intrathoracic gastric conduit following esophagectomies, and after Whipple's resection, the loss of the duodenal pacemaker. So, uh, again, to remind us that ERAS, at least in my view, is a tailor-made concept of multimodal intervention to reduce stress and protect functional capacity, as shown by Hel Henrik Kjellitz's iconic slide. And it's not a fixed protocol, a one-size-to-fit-all, especially not when physiology is deeply altered. We must acknowledge that ERAS might look very different. So how do we proceed? How do we meet up with the challenges ahead? Well, we reduce variations and we try to stay sober. Uh, nine years ago, we published the results of a survey of perioperative care for colorectal surgery in the northern European countries, and we could demonstrate that there were huge variations uh, in the extent to which available evidence uh, were uh, implemented across, the, across these countries. And uh, the accompanying editorial by Erbach and Baxter, you've seen this many times on our webpage, uh, they suggest that the immediate challenge to improving quality of care is not necessarily to discover new knowledge, but to integrate what we already know into practice and to reduce variation. And we were again reminded of this by this paper has been shown several times during these days, the Lancet paper two years ago, showing that in-house mortality is 20 times higher in the high mortality countries compared to Finland and Iceland. And again, as been shown also previously, if you want to reduce mortality, of course, you must reduce the rate of major complications. But that, not, that is not uh, alone enough, because again, the Gafferi trials showing us that the high mortality and the low mortality group of hospitals in the US, they have the same rate of major complications. And the difference is their ability to rescue those undergoing major complications or their rate of failure to rescue. So again, the iceberg for the 20th time, uh, this time to illustrate that there are still large deficits in our knowledge base. What we know, what we read about, are published series from a very small proportion of the centers, from the vanguard centers, the top-notch dedicated groups, and um, we know very little from the others. And also, the patients that are recruited to the randomized control trials are only a small, tiny proportion of the, of the patients that we treat. And they're not necessarily representative. And this, of course, creates a huge bias. We're only aware of the top 10% of the iceberg, and underneath lurks vast uncertainties. To put it in another way, we cannot focus only on the top-notch dedicated centers here exemplified by uh, the Vidovre series for open colectomies or the Guilford series for laparoscopic colectomies, 
because we must remember, although these are seminal series, very important proofs of principle, they show us where the ceiling is, where the target should be, what we should aim for, we must not lose focus on, on the 90%, uh, on the because most people are not operated at Vidovre or in Guildford, they're treated by the average centers. And to improve the average performance, it's much more important for overall outcomes. But again, we know very little about the average centers. Uh, I have sketched this here with a normally distributed proportion of bell-shaped curve, but we don't know if that is the fact. We have very little data except for the top-notch centers. So we must reduce variations and try to stay sober. And what I mean by that is we must not let ourselves be tricked or carried away too easily. There are many remaining issues to explore in upper GI and pancreatic surgery. I'll just touch briefly on four of them. Immunonutrition, food at will, ERAS complete protocols, and minimally invasive surgery. You know this pyramid, placing RCT technology on the very top. And as RCTs goes, the supreme case for a double-blinded RCT is whether immunonutrition has anything going for it or not. Because an RCT for immunonutrition can be double-blinded. It's a stable intervention. It's reversible, not skill-dependent to deliver. It's not complex, and we have a situation with a large risk of publication bias. So the gold standard is achievable and well within reach, and we should not accept any inferior design. And I believe this is the reason that uh, there are different conclusions when looking at the evidence from the ESPEN guidelines of 2007, where immunonutrition is recommended for all upper GI and pancreatic patients heading for surgery for cancer, while the ERAS pancreatic guidelines last year and the ERAS gastric guidelines now in the pipeline, both of them do not recommend immunonutrition for these patients as a routine. What about food at will? for these patients. Well, that's a, not a perfect case for an RCT, but it's a fair case for an RCT. Could we treat these patients exactly as we would the colorectal patients? And I believe the answer is that we probably can. And we did pull off a large multicenter RCT in Norway six years ago, and did not find any signs of, uh, of poor outcome for those treated like a colorectal patients. Of 450 patients, half of them were treated just like any colorectal patients. Among these, 75 gastric resections, 50 pancreatic resection, almost all of them Whipples, 25 livers, and, but as you see, only a few uh, single esophageal resections, and we were probably wrong to try to include these patients in this trial. So there remains specific issues for the esophageals. So what about the remaining two core issues, how do we evaluate the entire ERAS protocol and how do we evaluate minimally invasive surgery for these patients. The problem with complex interventions like an ERAS protocol is that they are haunted by trial effects or Hawthorne effects. So my, just to exemplify for you, I would suggest that we introduce Spanish as the new language for all Norwegian surgical wards. To do so, it would be fun, that's one thing, but the other thing is that we would it would result in lowered morbidity and lowered length of stay across our nation because it would necessitate a complete makeover of administration, restructuring of wards and personnel, new emphasis on education, evidence, science, modern care, and a feeling of new deal and new optimism. This is well known to you. This is the trial effect. Patients in trial do better. Any protocol will improve results. And I'm, and I'm not saying that ERAS protocol is not better than any random protocol. I'm just saying that an RCT is not necessarily a good way to show it. And the problems of Hawthorne's effects are especially pronounced for unblinded complex interventions that run over a long time. The other challenge we're up against with an ERAS protocol is the poor control arm. Most series published, comparative series, have an historical control group or a conventional or outdated uh, control group and comparing with an obviously substandard performance does not prove you're an athlete. So pulling these two things together, an RCT is not well suited to evaluate whether an ERAS protocol is a good thing because blinding is not possible. You will have gross contamination of groups no matter what you do. You will either have an invalid control group or an unethical control group and you will be haunted by Hawthorne effect and the results you get 
will have poor generalizability and poor validity, or most probably, both. This is Archimedes. You know him from school, and his famous uh, quote, give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it, and I shall rock the world. And to twist that, give me a complex intervention and a poor control, and I shall prove to you that the earth is flat. But in everyday life, the king rules, and the name of the king is the randomized control trial. And especially so for colorectal surgery. I did a quick search on the PubMed a few days ago for meta-analysis and systematic reviews evaluating ERAS randomized control trials in colorectal surgery only. And there are 18 meta-analysis and systematic re reviews. And they're analyzing six or seven or 12, and at the most, 16 RCTs. And it's the same trials repeated again and again. So 18 meta-analysis and systematic reviews, reviews evaluating 16 trials. And I would hold, put it to you that when the number of meta-analyses is greater than the number of trials analyzed, there's a severe risk of rumination. And we're actually chewing again and again on the same piece of information. And this is a waste of money and of time and of, uh, and of resources. So what about minimally invasive surgery? We know that it's a central step to enhance recovery, and it's now the default technique for several operations, and this will expand. So should we perform RCTs to prove this? Well, uh, the laparoscopic access is also a poor candidate for an RCT, and I'll give you just two examples. These are two impressive trials, two very important trials. The Majid trial from 1996, open versus uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy and Buss's trial from Henry Keller's group, 2005, laparoscopic versus open colectomy. And both these trials use double-blinded randomized methodology, top-notch methodology. Sackett and his colleagues from, from uh, McMaster University and the evidence-based movement, this is all they ask for. This is the best you can get. And these, they are evaluating this for short-term outcome. And Majid found no difference and Bassa found no difference. And we know this now to be wrong. We know that the difference is much smaller than they would have us believe in the 90s. Much smaller difference between the outcomes for laparoscopic and open surgery, but there is a difference. Half of you are performing laparoscopic day case cholecystectomies. None of you are performing day case open cholecystectomies. And also for colonic resection, there is a difference. So how come this difference does not show? These trials have been run with top-notch methodology and it's not actually um, very strange. It's nothing wrong with the RCT. It's just that it's not a magic bullet. And sometimes it's the wrong tool. It's, it was made, and it was made famous evaluating the new drug, the, uh, evaluating a linear cause-effect relationship. And it was not made to, to measure magnitude of effect. And it's very poorly suited to, eval to evaluate skill-dependent interventions with a learning curve which is the typical minimally invasive surgery situation, nor was it made to evaluate a complex intervention like an ARES protocol. We looked into this in some detail, and it's actually very easy to foresee in advance at the planning stage whether you will end up with very poor uh, data lacking robustness and whether an RCT is actually not a good idea at all. So again, to remind ourselves that for upper GI and pancreatic surgery patients, the advent of laparoscopy and ERAS have emerged in spite of RCTs, not because of RCTs. And if you insist on continuing doing RCTs in these two instances, we will drain vast resources and we will have almost no impact on our practice. And if completed with an RCT, and and be, be warned that you, there are lots of trials that you never see because they are ab aborted prematurely, because the, the uh, scientists are unable to recruit sufficient patient numbers or sufficient surgeons for the randomized trials. But if at all completed, they will produce results that will lack internal validity or generalizability, or again, most probably, they will lack both. The alternative approach is a consecutive and robust cohort registry putting in all the patients all the time. And this is not just an audit tool, this is a very powerful research tool. So, again, there are times, like now, when we must choose between what is easy and what is right. And that's much more difficult than choosing between what is wrong and right. And presently, the easy choice is a reflex 
uh, RCT, and that's not necessarily the right thing to do. So, to conclude, please do reduce variations in care. Don't lose sight of the 90% majority out there. Please develop new knowledge and do perform double-blinded RCTs for immunonutrition or for any other issue that's well-suited for a double-blinded RCT. Please explore the mechanisms of gut function following esophageal and pancreatic head resections and provide us with unselected and prospective cohort series. And don't expect ERAs to look exactly the same for all areas of surgery. And don't repeat meta-analysis if there's nothing new to analyze and don't perform RCTs if it's not a suitable instrument. Thank you very much. <laughs>